What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 235 at block height 645,892 on Saturday, August 29th. So, what's up, Janine? Hello, hello. Well, what is up this week is that, that um, well, something Chris wanted me to say, but I am being powered by the sun right now. My computer is being powered by the sun. Epic. You guys really uh like pushed it to the limit and set up everything you could on that. Um, not everything, but it does power a surprising number of things, and despite the weather not being great anymore, it gets a surprising amount of power from the sun. So uh at one point there was a well, I think it's still might be running um but at one point the bitcoin node is running on it and that was working so dope solar is an option even in not optimal environments Mm -hmm. so but what is not up this week is some people's influence hold on hold on because i need to blow (laughs) your mind and everybody's mind with a fucking mind-blowing fact uh, that I never knew until this week. So um, recently, a California circuit court um, threw out and declared um, the California ban on um, magazines or clips that could hold more than a certain number of bullets as unconstitutional. Um, It was a two of three um, decision by a panel of circuit court judges. And you are never going to fucking believe who one of the judges was. He's a fucking Hmm. roof Korean. He is literally the iconic roof Korean guy. The guy in the red polo shirt who was just like caught in the, the iconic picture holding his fucking rifle up in the air on the roof during the fucking LA riots. It's the fucking roof Korean. One of the judges who fucking did that is the roof Korean. That is quite interesting. <laughs> like that dude is more American than half of the fucking Americans in this country who were actually born here. Like that is like holy fucking shit. That is so awesome. But yeah, I just I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, the Roof Korean has done much more than be a meme and a public figure. He became a damn judge and is actually out there making judicial decisions to protect that right that he actually, you know, exercised during that fucking nightmare shit show. So God bless fucking Roof Koreans. Cool. All right, now that I got the little positivity out of the way, um, let's get into sad things that, why did you do that? Yes, why oh why? That is the question that a lot of people have been asking, and many of you probably know what we're about to talk about, which is the INX limited token offering. Uh, So if you didn't see it, on August 24th, a Gibraltar-based company called INX Limited announced that the SEC had approved their initial public offering, the offering, of up to 130 million INX security tokens, referred to as INX tokens or tokens. Uh, This is pulled from Yahoo Finance, which is one of the 
places that the plus, uh, press release was given to. INX has sent the offering set the offering price at ninety cents per token with a minimum investment of one thousand dollars. It is anticipated that the offering will begin on August twenty fifth. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have given much of a shit about this announcement whatsoever uh, had not one of their advisors decided to advertise the ICO token sale through his personal Twitter. And yes, it is an ICO because an ICO is an initial coin offering. This is an initial coin offering. The term is based on IPO with tokens. It's an ICO. So... I believe this was on the 25th, which is when the token sale started. Uh, Jameson Lop tweeted, Not an equity offering, not your mama's ICO, a guaranteed share of cash flow at tokens INX Co. And unsurprisingly, a lot of people initially assumed that his Twitter had been compromised because no one really expected him to be advertising for an ICO. In fact, I was so disappointed and shocked that I fell for a fake screenshot of the advisory board that someone tweeted, which included Jay Rule, the organizer of the disastrous fire festival, which I take responsibility for making that mistake. It was unbelievably weird. And unfortunately, something like that um, became believable because I was so shocked at how downright weird this entire situation is. So the actual main team of INX does not include J. Rule, um, but it does include a guy named Shai Datica, who is the founder, the co-founder and president of some companies, uh, Forex Manage LTD and ILS Brokers, both of which do not appear to exist anymore, or at least are not operating websites. Um, he's the former chief executive officer of those, according to his bio, who knows? Uh, there's also Alan Silbert, who is the brother of Barry Silbert. And then the advisory board has some familiar faces, including Jameson Lopp, uh, Elena uh, Veranova. Ver- I don't know. I bet. Yeah. Uh, Stefan Jespers, a.k.a. Whale Panda, and a few other people, but they're not as memorable names. Now, of course, the... News of this uh, was stimulated by the SEC's acceptance of a filing that INX had made regarding their INX token, which I will now go through a minute while I scroll. So this is the registration statement under the Securities Act of 19... Uh, you just cut out for me. Yeah, I accidentally maximized the page and I lost my notes. Um, Oopsies. So this is... This is the registration statement under the Securities Act of 1933, which is the kind of statement that you make when you're going to do an IPO. And in that statement, it is listed that the following advisory board members were offered options to purchase an aggregate number of 1,950,000 INX tokens at the price of one cent per token. This is not the entire list. You can see the entire list, but I'm mainly highlighting the people that we would be interested in. Stefan Jespers, aka Whale Panda, got 250,000 tokens. Elena got 150,000 tokens. Jameson Lop got 250,000 tokens. And Samson Mao, 100,000 100, tokens. So basically, by becoming advisors, these people and others on the advisor board would theoretically, they have these tokens and they would be able to sell them at 90 times the price that they got them for. Uh, for example, James Lop, uh, a- as it seems to be presented in the document, he would have paid about two thousand five hundred dollars for the tokens at the price of one cent. Um, but then, at the value of ninety cents, they would now be worth two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. And I'm sure there's probably some kind of agreement that they have that requires them to hold on to them or a certain percentage for a period of time or whatever. I have no idea. But it still stands that they got early access to a token sale that is now being sold at a much higher price. And uh, then there is a very interesting article from Joe Weisenthal at Bloomberg, uh, which I found quite disturbing. And I will now read pretty much in its entirety because it is so disturbing and needs to be read. 
Alrighty, so he says, yesterday I came across a chart in a new crypto token offering and I joked that it reminded me of one of those infamous SoftBank charts, which is always a good sign, by the way. Uh, here it is. It's got such grandiose implications, a new asset class as historic as the Dutch East India Company, while also not saying much at all. You see, once there was debt, then there was equity, and now finally finance has reached new heights with the security token offering called INX. But what is INX and what does the chart mean and what is the X, what is the Y axis? Now, the chart he's referring to, you obviously can't see it because this is audio, but the chart he's referring to is literally three blue bubbles along a timeline from 2000 BC until 2020. The first blue bubble in 2000 BC is labeled the second blue bubble in 1602 is marked equity and Dutch East India. And the third blue bubble in 2020 is marked security tokens and yeah. highlights highlights the the launch of INX Limited as if this token is a groundbreaking momentous occasion in history equivalent to debt in quotes that began um, in ancient Sumeria when civilization first began and was recorded on clay tablets. Yeah, and was also probably the foundation of human language as we know it, or at least written language, um, because mm -hmm. that's one of the thing. That's one of the theories about the development of of written language is that the first thing that things that were written down was records of who owned what and debts and money and stuff like that. So mm, the <laughs> the arrogance of that is so palpable. <laughs> and I I'm sure that I'm not the first person to laugh about this. Um, I'm sure a bunch of other people have laughed. There are already memes using all, this chart. All I but can seriously say is I hope to God that that was like some random intern way down the chain who had no clue what he was doing that was told, make a nice graph. Because if that's not the explanation, oh. like, holy shit. Like, holy shit. Well, <laughs> there, um, there is an explanation, and it is not that. Um, so Joe writes, I talked on the phone with Douglas Borthwick, chief marketing and business development officer at INX. And the first thing he explained to me is that there's no actual Y access. It's really whatever you want it to be. He says the chart is just supposed to show over time how things have changed. Okay. Um, Joe continues. So um, how is it a new kind of security that's different than debt or equity? According to Borthwick, INX is a new crypto trading platform that's launching a fully regulated, fully regulated, audited token IPO. The token he explained to me entitles the owner to 40% of the firm's cumulative adjusted net operating cash flow, which we will get into in a moment. <laughs> The chart above, technically it's not equity because it entitles the holder to a specific predefined share of the cash flows. It's not just the residual of what's left over, which is what goes to equity. And of course, it's not debt because it could theoretically allow a holder to get part of the upside. As Borthwick put it, this is an IPO of the cash flow. It's not an IPO of the equity. Um, also, the token has utility component as traders on the INX platform which we will also get into in a second, will be able to theoretically use their tokens to get discounts on coins, and the usage of these coins in trading would shrink the overall float, whatever that is, leaving more cash flow to the remaining token holders. In addition, the hope is that by having the traders on the room also as token holders and thus beneficiaries of the upside, they'll form a community and evangelize INX and the token. That doesn't sound bad at all, does it? Um, we'll see, he continues, we'll see how it goes. The IPO of the coin is today, as in the, the 25th, and they're trying to raise 170, 117 million, selling 130 million coins at 90 cents each, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, yes, I will go into the problems <laughs> as I scroll. Go ahead. If you have a or, well, I don't know. I, I'm going to just let you uh, 
get through with breaking down everything and your issues before I drill it down to the things I really have a problem with. Yeah, so um, there is a slight problem with the claim about how the token entitles you to 40% of their cumulative adjusted net operating cash flow. First of all, should be clear, if you are entitled to anything, you would be entitled to the pool that is 40% of their cumulative adjusted net operating cash flow. You're not getting 40% of anything, your pool, but whatever. Um, it, it, it's pretty clear reading the SEC filing that that is mm, not as simple as they say it is. Uh, and you can see that pretty clearly by just going through the document uh, with the keywords, no assurance. Just look for those two words. And let's go through a few of those. Number one, and this is from the SEC filing that Jameson Lopp also tweeted out and shared to people, so it's not a secret. Um, one instance, uh, it says, we have taken no steps toward the establishment of such a platform which will require the development of technological solutions as well as federal and state regulatory. Accordingly, there is no assurance that such a trading platform will ever be developed. Number two, there can be no assurance that we will be able to distribute any funds to the INX token holders. Number three, and these are, by the way, these points are all taken from separate parts of the document. I am just listing them in order of the, the areas where I found the phrase no assurance, and that will be important later. So number three, even if we close this offering, there can be no assurance that we will ever generate any operating activity or develop and operate the business as planned. Number four, there can be no assurance that we will have the financial and technological resources necessary to complete the development of our trading platforms if their development costs more um, than we have estimated or requires technology and expertise that we do not have and cannot develop. Number five, there can be no assurance that there will be an active market for INX tokens either now or in the future. U.S. persons may only trade INX tokens on a registered securities exchange or alternative trading system, ATS, that has accepted the tokens for trading or quotation. Uh, and number six, um, and here's the most interesting one, which is quite long, so I have to scroll a bit. Alrighty, so number six, the most interesting one. There can be no assurance that we will be able to pay any cash distributions to the holders of tokens. Under the INX token purchase agreement, holders of INX tokens are entitled to receive a pro rata cash distribution equal to 40% of our cumulative adjusted operating cash flow. As of December 31st, 2018, cumulative adjusted operating cash flow was a negative cash flow of approximately $3,850,000. Because each INX token holder's right to a pro rata distribution is based on our cumulative adjusted operating cash flow, no distribution will be made to INX token holders, if at all, until the company generates positive adjusted operating cash flows that overcome this deficit. Thus, you may not receive a pro rata distribution, even in years in which we are profitable due to our history historical losses. We do not accept that there will be sufficient net cash flow from operating activities for any distributions to be made to INX token holders until our business becomes commercially accepted. In addition, we may elect to operate our business and pursue business strategies such as acquisitions and the development of other products, which could adversely affect our ability to generate net. Now you may say, well, isn't it a good thing that they're being so blatantly honest? And look, they're spelling out all of the risks and making clear that they can't make any promises. But then I will remind you that Jameson Lopp and a bunch of the other people were tweeting encouragement and ad, basically ads for INX that said you could get, in Jameson Lopp's words, a guaranteed share of cash flow. Guaranteed. There is no guarantee here whatsoever because not only is there no trading platform at this very moment, there is a negative cash flow history, which they have to account for first before you anyone would get anything, except for Alan Silbert, who gets paid a guaranteed amount um, for some reason. Furthermore, uh, the, and this is the last major quote, there's another document titled Registration Statement for Certain Foreign Private Issuers. Um, and I will scroll to read this as well. Now, this one says... Um, 
the prospect of any holder of INX tokens to receive any cash distributions from us is highly uncertain. That was a header and it's in bold. It's highly uncertain. As of December... Now, this is an update. So the previous statement, the, the long one I just read, that was they them reporting their cumulative adjusted operating cash flow as of t- the end of 2018. This is the end of 2019, so this is recent. As of December 31st, 2019, cu- cumulative adjusted operating cash flow was a negative cl- cash flow of approximately $6,364,000. Because each INX token holder's right to a pro rata distribution is based on our cumulative adjusted operating cash flow, no distribution will be made to INX token holders, if at all, until the company generates more positive adjusted operating cash flows that exceed this deficit. They also state, our balance sheet as of December 31st, 2019 includes a financial liability for INX token holders in the amount of $1,179,000. I will repeat that, a financial liability for token holders. Now, uh, yes, these are now my final thoughts. What annoys me most about this story is that instead of understanding how shocking their involvement in this project might be to some people, and the fact that they're advertising it might be also shocking, a few of the advisors have been brushing this off as, you know, so-called toxic maximalists who hate all other forms of money besides Bitcoin, blah, 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 which I find, frankly, ridiculous and disingenuous, because as I said at the start, I wouldn't give a fuck that a bunch of them decided to buy these or be involved in INX. When I do start to care is when they started advertising this financial product to the public under false premises, which is exactly the type of shit behavior that we, including them, spent months and months calling out during the ICO boom in 2017. I don't care what what shitty tokens you decide in your private time, but it does annoy me that they thought it was okay to take advantage of the following that they had, uh, you know, calling Ethereum a scam, calling ICOs a scam, focusing mostly on Bitcoin, to then advertise a product that has, at this moment, negative prospects. That is a liability in their own documents. And so I don't care who you are. I'm going to inform people that this sounds like bullshit and that the behavior that I've seen so far has not convinced me otherwise in any way. Um, I've also seen some people say that this kind of thing is normal, quotes, for IPOs and equity and all of that stuff. And all I have to say to that is, if this is normal, I'm not a fan. Isn't the point of Bitcoin that we are supposed to question the stuff that is done in the financial world and why it's considered normal, but is so often actually just criminal behavior by governments and banks? that has been normalized to be acceptable when to ordinary people it isn't. That is the end of my rant. Yeah, so I guess first, um, I'm gonna start with a few things I don't have problems with. Um, I see nothing wrong with people involved in this early, you know, getting a preferential rate, that's the same thing as getting in before something goes public. And to my understanding, that's locked up so that none of them can really just dump that on uh, people who rush in's heads. And then I'm sure I didn't read this anywhere near as thoroughly as you did, but I saw in reference to any kind of liquidation event where the business shuts down, Um, if no new business related to it assumes the liabilities for, um, holders, then that automatically triggers a breach of their, um, obligations to token holders and pretty much puts the entire company into liquidation where an arbitrator would deal with things. But those two things aside, um, oh yeah. And also, um, again, I'm assuming you went through this way more thoroughly, so correct me if you found something uh, Mm -hmm. explaining this more clearly. But 
my read of the no assurances such a platform would be built was just in reference to like a futures um, options and swaps uh, platform, not like the actual spot exchange. But all of that said, um, you know, this is an exchange that isn't even up and running yet, um, isn't fucking operating in any way. And I'm not so skeptical that they could build a spot exchange for crypto out, but a futures exchange options swaps in this space. Um, I know people who've actually designed like futures products and shit in this space. Um, and really to me, all of the people involved in this, they do not um, seem to have the experience to really jump in and, and grasp how to do that stuff in crypto land. And then on top of that, the exchange market is just so crowded and saturated at this point. Um, like, how are you going to attract liquidity? Like, you know, what, what's your plan here to give yourself an edge getting into this ridiculously crowded market starting from scratch right now? Um, I'm highly skeptical that's going to work out. And so, like, you know, I don't have any problem with a security token or with this being on ETH. Um, I just think that this company is going to fail. Like, looking at the actual market they're trying to get into, the state of things now, where they're at, like, I don't see them actually growing to a sizable footprint in that market especially with any kind of like futures or, or derivatives products. So like just on that basis alone, seeing a business that I just think doesn't, isn't really going to get off the ground um, and seeing how clearly in my mind that's spelled out in the prospectus, like the stark disconnect between that and what's being pitched on Twitter, like guaranteed cash flow. What's the guarantee that you're going to start a successful exchange? Like, I would have no problems if they had just made bullet points out of the prospectus or directly pointed people to that. But like the, the complete disconnect between how it's being portrayed on Twitter versus the reality of this business is mind boggling to me. Yeah. But, and I mean, I. Oh, you're breaking. Sorry. Do you still want you were breaking well, up a little like, so i wasn't yeah. sure if you're done what what what's your edge against um coinbase or kraken you know how, how are you going to compete with things like deribit or bybit or bitmax in terms of derivative shit like what's your game plan yeah i mean i i don't know they haven't really released any information about that and you know most of what i was reading was stuff that concerned me from you know the <laughs> the reality of what token holders are going to get i didn't even get into the technicals and i do care about the fact that they're launching it on ethereum in fact the weird things is that they're going to be maintaining a whitelist which literally a whitelist of people's names and some kind of kyc aml uh like identifier or something is going to be stored on a whitelist the whitelist is going to be stored on ethereum albike uh, you know encrypted <laughs> with the key that they're going to hold but like no i'm sorry i don't want i i'm not in favor of people's names and kyc information being stored on a blockchain regardless of whether it's ethereum or anything i just find that idea to be extremely stupid so yeah. I do care about the fact that like there's some really weird technical things underpinning this and I haven't been exactly comforted by the claims that they are going to move to liquid given that they haven't given any sort of timeline for doing that whatsoever and it's not mentioned in the filing. So yes. Um, and, you know, because they claimed, oh, Liquid wasn't up and running at the time, so it didn't make sense to build it on Liquid. 
but the fact is you still like they listed a extensive list of risks so they could have included you know migrating to a different platform as one of the risks they could have declared that and they didn't who knows why um if the sec was so against that idea that they excluded it from the filing then well then you should have disclosed the fact that the sec might be against you actually moving to the platform that you want to use that is a risk <laughs> um because if that plan goes bad um you're stuck on ethereum with an erc20 token and you're storing a whitelist on ethereum uh which then entails all of the problems like are you going to run an ethereum node now are you going to participate in ethereum consensus and all of that fun stuff. like you know that is a concern for me it's not the main concern because there are so many other things going wrong with this that I felt like that was almost an underwhelming aspect of this but yeah um, buyer beware yeah that's absurd to me that anything needs to be on ETH except a unique identifier that is just tied to data in a centralized database. Um, I cannot comprehend why anything else needs to be on a blockchain for that. But yeah. Just because something um, is done by the book and following regulations does not mean it is a good investment. Yeah, I am... Um... I am, let's say, not impressed by the counter argument that, oh, we wanted to do an ICO in the regulated way. And it's like, look, the, I mean, as the person who is not very appreciative of governments and regulation, the problem that I had with the ICO boom was not that the ICOs were unregulated or that regulation would solve the issues they were having. My problem was with misleading marketing and hyping stuff that was not secure by people that didn't have a reputation worth investing in. Those were my problems with that. Um, guess what? Those problems are happening right now with INX and it's supposedly a regulated ICO. You still get the misleading marketing. You still get a technical foundation that is a bit suspicious. Like, all of those elements are still here just because the SCC has given it a stamp. Not make me any more comfortable with it. Yep. Well, want to move on to more stupid fucking things going on? Mm-hmm. So, um, last week, uh, Mount Pellerin in Geneva and Crypto Finance AG and 21 Analytics in Switzerland um, conducted a test um, for FTA or FATF travel rule compliant transactions. Um, yeah. And so... I kind of wanted to touch on this and a little bit of an update uh, on the general state of all these things because we've kind of just scattershot touched on a few of the different attempts at protocols like this, uh, such as INGs or cipher traces and the recent group that uh, BitGo and Coinbase are a part of. But um, all of these things in general um, are kind of coalescing around a uh, inter-VASP or virtual asset service provider um, messaging standard, which is at least kind of setting um, standards for all the, the data structures involved in identifying information, um, potentially communication and how that's passed along. And uh, despite the fact that there is kind of a, a mess of different protocols being proposed um there is this larger standards body for data structures that they're all coalescing around so uh this test was done using um open vasp a um, protocol for this we haven't covered and the um system that ing is working on uh trp so most of these protocols have um 
pretty much been moving in the direction of working like certificate authorities with a completely independent peer to peer network. Um, so pretty much just kind of emulating the, the way um, TLS authorities work. Now, this open vast system that was part of the test is built on Ethereum. <laughs> and oh, goody. Yeah. Th this is all. Uh, yeah. And, and this this is uh, actually pretty widely supported in the, the sense of groups behind it. Um, one second, I got to find a window. But um, yeah, this has a, uh, a number of more mainstream um, or Web 3.0 facing members, as well as a bunch of uh, self-regulatory bodies are involved in this. Um, such as the Korea Blockchain Association, the, the Japanese equivalent, um, a number of groups like that. But the, the general idea here is effectively to have every VASP create a standardized Ethereum smart contract where they would truncate the last 32 bits of that contract address to be their... Um, service provider ID in this system um, with which they would concatenate a unique standardized uh, ID number for customers. So depending on, uh, well, this probably isn't uh, an issue. Um, most of these companies probably do something compatible or easy to make compatible, but a standardized identifier for customers. Um, and they do meme a little bit about um, opening up uh, the idea of each customer having a unique identifier per payment for privacy purposes. Um, and uh, pretty much these contracts would have fields for actual business identifiers, such as corporate names, um, you know, the address of the HQ and shit like that, as well as a key to establish communications um, channels with them securely, a key to verify the identity. And then here's a big bit of stupid. Um, this would be a standard contract that's only accessed by being called from other contracts. So you would specify in this the owner of your VASP contract as well as the administrator who can update it. And then there is a field for um, regulatory authorities to certify a VASP's contract here and let that contract cite it, as well as different VASPs kind of uh, vouch for each other to create a web of trust. And as far as the communications layer, the idea is that you use the truncated VASP ID to get that to them. And then obviously the uh, number for a customer um, allows them to route it internally. And they have structured this so that they can generalize the message delivery layer. Um, and one of the examples they make is um, emails where the VASP and customer ID are just the subject of the email as a way that you could pass that around. But they are also looking at um, using a whisper um, net. It's uh, a pretty much a messaging system that uses Ethereum as a reputation authority, but actually passes messages on its own peer-to-peer -peer network um, completely off-chain. Um, and they use proof of work as a Sybil prevention method. So if they were to use this WhisperNet as the comms layer for a protocol like this, um, every message would involve proof of work, which would get really computationally intense and potentially expensive for anybody who interacted with that layer. And uh, they also want to tie it to the Ethereum name service system. Um, so that the... 
Yeah, so that the truncated VASP ID um, would be a .eth domain um, that uh, could be a shorthand way to connect to different services um, between one another. And um, yeah, pretty much an entire uh, protocol flow to support a VASP um, pinging another, validating that... Uh, the customer transfer ID that their user gave them is legit um, and getting a response to that before actually sending a, uh, a transaction. And another design goal of this is to be as generalized as possible, um, not designing itself to work with any specific type of blockchain or scripting system or anything like that and to try to take into account second layers. And um, yeah, so this is a giant shit show that's just casting a massive scrambled web of dependencies across ETH smart contracts um, that could get fucked with potentially um, and would be the validation layer to make sure that exchanges and shit aren't doing illegal things or violating regulations. Um, so yeah, that, um, if this becomes a dominant protocol for this, um, could potentially wind up being very hilarious. Um, that popcorn potentially aside though, um, I think that the coalescing around a data structure standards here, um, should be pretty alarming to everybody in the sense of um, if that is really universally standardized, then they can come up with a million different stupid protocols um, to transfer data around. But once you plug in the, the protocol, the business you're trying to connect to is using, you're speaking the same data structure language already. So, yeah. How I knew your customer. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's something looming on the horizon. I mean, part of me wants to scream when I hear about things being built on Ethereum, but another part of me wants to cheer because stuff like this is just going to... You're cutting out there. What? oh You're back. Okay, I dropped out for some reason. Deanna say didn't want you to say what you were trying to say. Well, if you didn't hear it, what I was trying to say is that part of me, when I hear about things being built on Ethereum, wants to scream because of how stupid it sounds, and the other part of me wants to cheer because it is going to accelerate the destruction of Ethereum. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like this is a uh, this is something really serious to consider um, in my mind in terms of if this really starts rolling out in use everywhere, um, how do users adapt to this? Like, how can you counteract this? How can you attempt to deal with this or introduce ambiguity into it or attack it? And yeah, um, I think this is a really major point of concern because this is step one of chain anchor. Um, start tying KYC data to actual transactions. And it doesn't matter what fucking mechanism you use to do it, whether it's some little op return output on chain or just a parallel database. Um, it doesn't matter. And at the kind of systemic level this could hit in terms of being standardized and starting to be adopted globally, that's a serious concern. Well, one way to fight back is to not use services that comply with this. Yeah, but most people won't. 
It doesn't matter what most people will do. The point is, what are you going to do about it? That's my point. This is something that needs thought beyond just don't use KYC stuff. People are going to keep doing that. And really, the slope of just, well, don't do it yourself leads to you're the little pool of bad coins. Your coins aren't fungible anymore. And like I said, bringing up Chain Anchor, a slow step to, well, maybe your coins aren't even getting mined anymore. And if, if everybody's reaction is going to be, well, just don't do it yourself, knowing the reality is a lot of people are anyway, um, then why don't we just give up now and just fork off? And we will if it gets that kind of extreme. Because I would rather be the little pool of dirty coins than the big bad KYC pool that has no interesting qualities and basically looks like the traditional financial system with even worse implications because it's a public chain and storing personal information on a public blockchain is stupid. That's not going to stop the direction the market goes if that point arrives in the first place. Well, the market is you. You are in the market. So if you don't want to see that happen, then you have to take responsibility and make decisions that do not go in that direction. And if other people don't go in that direction, well, that is something you will have to deal with in the future if enough people make that decision. But I'm not going to change my principles just to conform to other people because other people are conforming to other people. I'm not suggesting you do. I'm saying that people need to think about how to attack these issues technologically as well. Alrighty, though. And this, and this is why ad mass adoption is worth nothing if it comes with this kind of shit. Yeah, but the reality is if it's going to come, um, it's going to come. Anyway, though, um, something I wanted to touch on, um, a recent court ruling regarding uh, Coinbase. And yeah, um, let's just say that this has been completely misportrayed by my reading of the actual um, appeal ruling um, pretty much everywhere. Um, it was somebody suing Coinbase for not giving him access to Bitcoin gold um, of his after the fork. And everybody is pretty much going around saying this is setting a legal precedent that if you have um, deposited or purchased something on an exchange in the US, that it is not legally yours. And this says absolutely nothing of the sort. Um, it pretty much, um, the three charges were, I believe, um, negligence, um, what the hell is it called? Um, conversion, which would mean to pretty much benefit from your assets and a violation of uh, the contractual agreement under the terms of service um, by not giving him access to the Bitcoin gold. Uh, so a breach of contract. And pretty much the court's ruling and what was upheld in the appeals was not that his Bitcoin or something he deposited or actually bought and established an agreement with Coinbase for um, was not his property because it was on Coinbase. It was pretty much that um, at no point did Coinbase actively take or, or affirmatively refuse access um, to something that they had a contractual agreement over. They chose not to proactively take steps to make it available to him when there was no contractual agreement to that. Um, no, nothing in the terms of service obligated them to support every fork. And their reason for doing so was the security concerns of a not fully open source brand new 
clients um, being integrated into their systems. And so pretty much the logic here and what was actually said in the ruling is that Coinbase has no obligation to affirmatively um, support or, or take any action to support something derivative that a third party creates, um, even if it has a relation to something they do support. So nothing whatsoever in this ruling says that if you deposit Bitcoin or any other coin that they support or purchase a supported coin or coin on Coinbase, that it is not your property. It is solely related to forks and things that would incur a new cost on the business or make them support something they are currently not. And so, yeah, um, this makes absolute sense to me. And I can't see why anybody would think that uh, this would go any other way. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. Um, see why it would make people unhappy because obviously even if the exchange doesn't support that particular fork coin, um, they obviously would still have the ability to access those coins and do something with them even if they're not being used on the platform itself. So I can see how people don't like that because it's like you're using a fork of said that under normal circumstances if, if I controlled my own keys I would have. but then again they're not your keys they're not your coins don't be surprised <laughs> mm -hmm. and I mean like I mean like pretty much my my attitude is like I mean of course this is what's going to happen um and unless Coinbase actually accesses and disposes of or gains from that in some way in future. I mean, I think this is just going to stand. Mm -hmm. And then I guess just real quick notice, because uh, there's almost no details here, but uh, Fidelity um, apparently has... Uh, a new project uh wise origin uh bitcoin index fund uh was incorporated this year under the uh president of fidelity um and just filed with uh very little details uh with the sec regarding to this so uh yeah uh fidelity is going to jump in and attempt to do a, a bitcoin fund and honestly uh I don't know. After how backed played out without really exploding or, or doing anything promising, uh, let's just say we'll see if it's another dud. Boop. Alrighty, so what is this interesting tale you have for us, Janine? Well, I have to say this is one of the most interesting stories that I've ever read that is not shitting on Ethereum, and so so I just wanted to shit just because I feel like if you're an Ethereum news, uh, uh, yeah, if you are an Ethereum user, this story is a good example of why you should run a node and how not being able to run one is uh, a huge problem. So uh, this is a story from Dan Robinson, which I think he published just yesterday, and he said on Wednesday afternoon, someone asked whether it was possible to swap liquidity tokens that had been accidentally sent to their pair contract itself. My initial thought was that the tokens would be locked forever, but late that night I had the sudden realization that if the tokens were still there, they were recovered by anyone. When anyone calls the burn function on a Uniswap core contract, the contract measures its own liquidity token balance and burns it, uh, giving the withdrawn tokens to the address specified by the caller. This is a core part of the intended behavior of Uniswap version 2. He then explains that the uh, dark forest, because the story is titled um, Ethereum is a Dark Forest, um, and he says, The Dark Forest is my favorite science fiction book. It introduces the concept of a dark forest, an environment in which detection means certain death at the hands of advanced predators. In this environment, publicly identifying someone else's location is, a go is as good as directly destroying them. This concept is also the inspiration for the Dark Forest game on the Ethereum testnet. 
In the Ethereum mempool, these apex predators take the form of arbitrage bots. Arbitrage bots monitor pending transactions and attempt to exploit profitable op opportunities created by them. No white hat knows more about these bots than Phil Dian, the smart contract researcher who, along with his colleagues, wrote the Flash Boys 2.0 paper and coined the term minor extractable value, which I've never heard of either of those things. But anyway, uh, Phil once told me about a cosmic horror story that he called a generalized front runner. Arbitrage bots typically look for specific types of uh, transactions in the mempool, such as the decentralized uh, exchange trade or an Oracle update, and try to front run them according to a predetermined algorithm. Generalized front runners look for any transaction that they could prof profitably, can't talk today, front run by copying it and replacing addresses with their own. They can even execute the transaction and copy profitable internal transactions generated by its own execution trace. Um, so in short, um, I had no idea that that was a thing and that does sound indeed like apex predators are in the mempool. And in short, due to these types of bots, um, when they attempted to do a rescue operation of the liquidity tokens that this person had lost, uh, they failed and they were worth $12,000. That was quite a big loss. And he concludes by saying, um... Uh, one second, I have to scroll a bit. He uh, concludes by saying, the weirder what you're doing is, the harder it will be to jam it through existing info, like Infura. In our case, we were trying to submit a transaction that looked like it would fail based on the current blockchain state, which Infura has reasonable protections against. Using our own node could have sidestepped this problem. So he basically says that in their attempt to recover these liquidity tokens, um, the nature of the Ethereum mempool being hostile, apparently, uh, prevented them from being successful uh, because they were relying on someone else's infrastructure and not using their own, in which they would have at least had a better chance. So I just thought this was a really interesting story. And once again, it shows, uh, there's, I mean, I've talked numerous times about why I think Infura is a problem and how it's, uh, or which episode, but there was a study that I read off um, many, many, many episodes ago about how so much Ethereum infrastructure relies on Infura. It's a centralized point of failure. So yeah, fun, fun, fun story about why you should run your own node. Yeah, that's the Infura thing is just hilarious and it's going to keep coming back in more and more shit, but Honestly, I would say that the, the general issue is more just a, a universal issue for mempools, period. It just gets extra hilarious for Ethereum because of how much complex stupidity that you can do on the base layer. But like, I think it was uh, Francis Poulet who, who uh, coined the phrase, the mempool is war. <laughs> like, if there is anything going on... um that is alterable or superseded by any entity or a set of entities. Um, and there's a way for them to benefit from that. They're going to do it. And I mean, especially um, miners, if miners can find a way to benefit from it, they're going to do it. Like th this is why things like trying to do an order book on a blockchain will never work. Because it's not just bloop and you're in the order. It's no, we're going to have a war now before the next block comes in. Let's see who wins. Decentralized order books will never happen. Yeah, I was just uh, quickly trying to see if I could find which episode I mentioned that study. And I haven't found it yet. But the last time I talked about Infura was episode 194. Uh, where... Um, that was when Consensus officially announced that they were acquiring Infura, and as everyone should know by now, I'm not a fan of Consensus either, because if Infura is the centralized point of failure in terms of infrastructure, Consensus is the centralized point of failure in terms of funding. Yep. Alrighty. So... Samurai uh, devs have been teasing something for the past few days. Um, Finally doing a uh, 
a peer-to-peer -peer communications layer so that people can collaborate together for post-mix uh, stuff. Because without a frictionless way to do that, um, yeah, you can be pretty sure most of the instances are just single user actions. So uh, as far as Samurai users go, um, this will be a huge improvement for them and a massive benefit in terms of how much using Postmix tools are actually helping your anonymity set not degrade in practice. But I, I do have to talk about how they're kind of pitching this and um, throwing this out there as a open comms layer that any other application can decide to use too, such as join market or coin swap. And um, I just do have to say that I find this completely disingenuous um, when you've had multiple things um, already established specs for communicating with each other over Tor. Um, Javier at Bustabit, um, you know, did the original pay join spec. Um, Mr. Cux from BTC Pay, um, I think was one of the, the core contributors of the, the new spec that they and Wasabi have implemented. And um, I do remember when that was first announced, um, Samurai whining all over Twitter about how they were the first to do pay joins, um, despite there being no way besides copy and pasting or using QR codes over random channels to coordinate it. Um, and pretty much accusing him of just doing that instead of implementing their version with no coordination layer, just doing what Blockstream told him. Um, so yeah, I find it a really disingenuous, um, play to try and frame things that way when there, there's other stuff out there that they could try to be compatible with where they're just kind of flexing nuts for no good reason. Um, doing something completely different, not compatible with other things, and then yelling at other people, change everything to use this now. Um, so, you know, this will be an improvement for Samurai users in the Samurai ecosystem, but the, the more I see Samurai keep doing these things to not try to work on compatibility across things, to work with standards related to privacy shit, um, like I just see these stupid silos that are obviously different silos of things um, developing in this space. And that doesn't help anybody. Like creating little fragmented pools of things that are easily identifiable as distinct pools is just limiting your anonymity set. It's limiting the crowd that you're blending in with. And I think that ultimately is a bad direction long term. Kate Passa? Well, before we move on to the next thing, I did end up finding the episode that I mentioned that survey uh, in, that, in the last story, which was episode 156, and the segment was called Daps More Like Craps. <laughs> Whoa. Because I'm so creative. Alrighty. I guess next up, uh, this won't take too long, but um, so uh, Merch, who everyone might know as uh, the guy who did a thesis on coin selection uh, that wound up informing a lot in Bitcoin Core, uh, wrote a little medium post looking at Taproot in terms of um, comparing them against standard multi-sig contracts. And uh, some pretty interesting uh, efficiencies here. So he pretty much is just looking at a, a standard two of three multi-sig where you have a user, um, something else being a 2FA, and then a backup key for the user. And comparing um, how you could construct this in Taproot against uh, the conventional pay to script hash. 
and it's really some pretty massive savings. If you give me one second. Um, so looking at a two of three, um, one input, one output pay to script hash transaction, um, that would be 338 bytes. If you look at an equivalent in a taproot, I'll come back to in a second, um, you get a lot of savings. So pretty much the structure he's looking at is a top level um, Schnorr Musig key. So a two of two that just has one key and one signature tweaked with a two branched um, taproot tree, each of which has a two of two um, that is a combination in one side, the service key, so the 2FA, and the user's backup key. And the other is the user's normal key and their backup key. And the interesting thing here is um, you can either do that with a normal 2 of 2 script um, with separate pub keys in it um, so that you can pass something around if your backup is air-gapped, or if you can secure it without air gapping it, um, you can make those um, music addresses as well. So it would just be one pub key, one signature. And you know you can wind up with up to a 45% savings. Um, if you look at the instance of two separate keys, um, the equivalent one input um, from a pay to tap root to a normal uh, BEC32 SegWit address would be 166 bytes. Um, if you use MUSIG for the inputs to get one key, one signature, um, you know, savings. And it's really kind of interesting. Um, I don't think necessarily um, I'd have to sit and draw a bunch of stuff and do some math that this is going to translate to larger multi-sig key sets. But it's really kind of interesting. You can save almost 50% in fees and block space um, just taking this and doing it with Taproot instead. So it's going to be some fun time seeing standardized scripts get redone and see uh, whether there's some efficiency gains there. Sweet. And also the nice benefit is that if you don't have to resort to a backup path, no one can even tell that it's a multi-sig. Mm -hmm. All right, what do we got next? Okay, uh, Trezor and Unchained Capital. So Unchained Capital collaborated with Trezor um, to set up a functionality where you can now, um, with the Caravan web wallet, um, actually verify uh, that the keys on your Trezor are able to sign for the appropriate key path in a multi-sig. So actually verify uh, the other public keys in the multi-sig and that that Trezor is actually a part of it, which is something um, they didn't do before. So. That allows users to protect themselves and verify uh, that the multi-sig address they're sending funds to are correct, as well as change addresses when spending from it. But um, yeah, that is a massive improvement um, in terms of you know security verification in using multi-sig. So let's give a, a sarcastic knee clap to that finally happening. That's my knee clap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what do we got here in this follow-up for some private shade balls? Well, yes, in episode 234, which was the last one, I talked about Palantir moving to their headquarters in Den or moving their headquarters to Denver, Colorado, and some of the perplexing claims that they were making about why they didn't fit into silicon valley and now we can be even more perplexed because plantier's registration statement for their ipo to the sec has also been made public and there is an opening letter from alexander carp the current ceo that says the following one minute while i scroll all right 
It says the engineering elite of Silicon Valley may know more than most about building software, but they do not know more about how society should be organized or what justice requires. Our company was founded at Silicon Valley, but we seem to share fewer and fewer of the technology sector's value commitments. From the start, we have repeatedly turned down opportunities to sell, collect, or mine data. Other technology companies, including some of the largest in the world, have built their entire businesses on doing just that. Software projects with our nation's defense and intelligence agencies, whose missions are to keep us safe, have become controversial, while companies built on advertising dollars are lace. For many consumer internet companies, our thoughts and inclinations, behaviors, and browsing habits are the products for sale. The slogans and marketing of many of the Valley's largest technology firms attempt to obscure this simple fact. The world's largest internet companies have never had greater access to the most intimate aspects of our lives, and the advance of their technologies has outpaced the development of the forms of cold control that are capable of governing their use. The bargain between the public and the technology sector has for the most part been consensual in that the value of the products and services available seem to outweigh the invasions of privacy that enable their rise. Americans will remain tolerant of the idiosyncrasies and excesses of the valley only to the extent that technology companies are building something substantial that serves the public interest. The corporate form itself, that is the privilege to engage in private enterprise, is a product of the state and would not exist without it. Our software is used to target terrorists and to keep soldiers safe. If we are going to ask uh, someone to put their, themselves in harm's way, we believe that we have a duty to give them what they need to do their job. We have chosen sides, and we know that our partners value our commitment. We stand by them when it is convenient and when it is not. Now, the reason this is so confusing is because there are a lot of things in this letter that I could agree with. Um, on the other hand, I find uh, the I find it weird that uh, essentially kind of the underlying argument behind this is, we don't feel like we belong in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley because they are selling, collecting, and mining data for the purposes of profit, but we're doing it for national security. That's basically their argument. Um, because the claim that they make about how they've repeatedly turned down opportunities to sell, collect, and mine data. It's like, sure, maybe maybe you have done that, but on the grand scale of things, um, for anyone who knows anything about Palantir, you'd know that been described as basically the private version of the NSA. Like, collecting and mining data is literally literally everything they do uh, when they're not, you know, sending employees to do corporate surveillance and stuff like that. But here's a summary for anyone who is not familiar with them that uh, is from my newsletter in June. It says, uh, oops, did I lose it? No, I didn't. Okay. So this is what how I summarize them in my newsletter from June. Uh, founded in 2003, building off of PayPal's fraud detection system, Palantir has been constructing data analytics products and services for corporate surveillance, counterterrorism, immigration enforcement, predictive policing programs, and thwarting whistleblowing while sidestepping public information laws in the process because they're playing that whole game of, you know, it's a bit harder to get information about what a company is doing that is being contracted by, by the government or do something in service of the government than it is to you know, get information about the government doing that. And um, an early investor was the CIA's InQtel venture capital fund, the same one which had its strategic investment to the precursor of Google, Google Maps and Earth. And the reason that's important is because not only did they get their early investment money from the CIA, the CIA was their main client for the first couple of years of their existence. They are literally just a private version of an intelligence service um further um they admit to a bunch of this in their sec filing um in one part 
They say we were founded in 2003 and started building software for the intelligence community in the United States to assist in counterterrorism investigations and operations. We later began working with commercial enterprises. We have built two principal software platforms, Palantir Gotham, because of course they did, and Palantir Foundry. Gotham, our first for protocol, was constructed for analysts at defense and intelligence agencies. They were hunting for needles, not in one, but in thousands of haystacks. And they did not have the software they needed to do their jobs. Afghanistan and Iraq soldiers were mapping networks of insurgents and makers of roadside bombs by hand. Gotham enables users to identify patterns hidden deep within data sets ranging from signals intelligence sources to reports from confidential informants and helps U.S. and allied military personnel find what they are looking for. Now, um, well, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, how do I put this? Not your best work Palantir, uh, if you know what I mean. I don't remember either of those countries uh, ending up particularly well with your help. Uh, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I again, the letter is interesting because there are definitely things, like the reason I even found it is because I saw a lot of people tweeting out excerpts. Like, there's a lot of things that you can agree with in it, like the fact that Silicon Valley, like that's why I kind of get <laughs> that like at the end of the day, Palantir does fit within Silicon Valley because their business model is still what Silicon Valley does at its foundational level, which is this advertising surveillance model. The fact that they they have chosen to sell to the government and to sell to the CIA and blah 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 like your client is different but your model is still the same you're not you're you're not exactly a paradigm of privacy respecting you know companies if you know what i mean yeah but it is kind of an interesting cultural insight that they think just because they're doing it for the government that distinguishes them from them materially yeah i mean the the letter is interesting because there there are parts that i agree with and i find it interesting that that's what they think distinguishes them from others because yeah like at the end of the day they're not fundamentally different. They just have different clients. But apparently that has that has made them not as welcome in Silicon Valley, I guess. Yep. Alrighty. I'm gonna swap these last two stories around though. Um with the caveat that apparently Peter Thiel's involvement in this company was a little overblown. He was still involved in it. But um, Layer One, a, uh, a company in Texas trying to expand out um, mining farms and co-location services um, and self-mining, is caught in a huge snafu. Um, so apparently, um, they were portraying... Um, one of the co-founders of Canon, um, Li Zingfu, I hope I pronounced that right, um, that he was actually involved in the company in terms of, I believe, supply chain management. Um, when in reality, um, he's not an investor, um, has no official involvement with the, the company, and really all he ever did was make kind of some informal introductions in China. Um, and that was the entire extent to his involvement in the company. Um, as well, um, looking back at the different references to a $50 million Series A rounding that they did, um, even limping forward to um, this year um, from around October of 2019, they were uh, kind of still doing that funding round while at different time periods um, making public announcements that they had succeeded in raising the entire amount when they had not. And they were still going around raising funding for that. 
<laughs> and um, another thing, although this, um, I could potentially see just being lumped in here baselessly, but odds are probably not. Um, they've been making claims of uh, developing their own um, ASICs to mine with in their Texas facility in partnership um, with a Beijing company that would be producing 10 nanometer chips running 30 watts per terahash. So around the most efficient hardware at the time, um, around now. So that um, is very dubious as their partner is a company called Ingenix um, out of Beijing that's currently um, only gotten down to 22 nanometers and all of their product lines are 28 and 22 nanometer chips. Um, but layer one is claiming they're going to start taping out these 10 nanometer mining ASICs in December of this year. And to um, top it all off, um, they're getting sued um, <laughs> by a uh, data center power management firm called Lancium um, for patent violation because of plans uh, of layer ones to deploy a demand response system that would pretty much um, spin miners up when um, grid demand is very low so that the, the electricity costs were cheaper and spin them down when there's a spike in grid demand and electricity goes up, um, which is apparently something um, that Lancium uh, was grant or granted a patent for um, in March this year. So uh, yeah, um, Peter Thiel was making a, a decent amount of public comments about bringing mining to America because of national security and uh, touting this company, despite his financial involvement being a lot smaller than it was portrayed. But um, yeah, things do not seem to be going well for this company. Interesting. And then I guess uh, this last one is not really uh, much here except uh, a uh, Wexin um, page that you can get the, uh, the link to in the Google Translate in the show notes and some Twitter threads. But apparently um, on the 24th of August, um, Inner Mongolia's uh, electrical authority um, has pretty much canceled all direct agreements between miners and power companies giving preferential electricity rates. So when this happens, um, you know, their costs are going to rise by something like a, a third uh, for their electricity. And this is where um, most of the ASIC manufacturers house a lot of their uh, equipment that they self-mine or lease um, in terms of location. And apparently miners in Jingjiang are worried that they're going to take a uh, similar direction. And um, a little interesting thing on top, although this um, is literally completely unverified aside from a Twitter thread and a claim. Um, but apparently the former head of Inner Mongolia Electric Power Company um, was investigated by the CCP um, just days after this uh, policy announcement was made regarding um, miners and their electricity rates. So it <laughs> seems to me like the, uh, the policy that's been going on for what, like two, three years now is uh, continuing to ratchet in the direction like they said they would. Uh, the CCP wants to slowly push mining out of China, it seems. And they're sticking with it. It really boggles my mind that the CCP is taking an approach like that rather than just um, showing up places and attempting to just discredit Bitcoin completely. Maybe they just have bigger things on their plate at the moment. Very likely until Bitcoin gets much bigger. And it will be too late. Hopefully.
hopefully. Alrighty though. I think that is a wrap for the day. Final thoughts? Um I'm still kind of just in awe of uh the roof Korean and uh half the things I wanna <laughs> wanna give final thoughts about I think will just uh get a lot of people really pissed off for no reason. That is pretty legit. Well, my final thought is um, there is currently an ongoing crowdfund to get some more money to the legal defense of Julian Assange. You can find that um, it's a campaign being run by his partner, Stella, at crowdjustice.com slash Julian Assange. Um, and so if you have any money to give, there's current, I think it passed 75000 pounds in the last day or so it's at like seventy seven thousand, so it's done super well considering it's only been up for about a week but everything is going to count because uh if you go to the page she basically explains like how many lawyers they have working on this case and that is not cheap um even when they're a lot of them are working like far below their usual rates because they care about the case um there's also a documentary that was uh, I think it was just published today, and you can find it at Stop... There's an account on Twitter called Stop the War. Um, the handle is STWUK. And the documentary is called The War on Journalism, uh, a film by Juan Passarelli. And I didn't look at how long it was, but it's a pretty good documentary. It basically sums up the history of the case and the precedent it could set and some, you know, footage from the uh, legal action protests over the last year. So I recommend checking that out if you can. Roof Korean, roof Korean, roof Korean. Cut yeah, you later. It's, uh... hey, wait, <laughs> you got something else? Well, I was, I was just going to say I would love to see uh, the judge in Assange's case, replaced by someone like the roof crew, but the free speech version. That would be a thing to see. Or maybe just the human rights, no torture version. That would also suffice. Alrighty, though. I guess, uh, hope you enjoyed. Catch you later, punks. Bye. Hello, <laughs> <laughs>